Edward Jr. died in 1978, a few days after being evicted from his Hollywood home. Fortune hadn't smiled on him for some time. He was drinking heavily and virtually broke, and he hadn't made a movie in nearly 20 years. His death went largely unnoticed. Yet today, his films aroused tremendous interest and enthusiasm. He was someone who can truly be called a cult director, thanks largely to such unforgettable movies as this one, his low-budget science fiction extravaganza, Plan 9 from Outer Space. First of all, you look at an Ed Wood film, and you know that you're watching an Ed Wood film. You couldn't confuse it with the work of any other filmmaker. It's, it's like a Fellini film or a Bergman film or a movie by Frank Capra. He has a very distinctive, absolutely unusual style. I mean, you can't compare something like a Plan 9 from Outer Space to any other filmmaker. At least uh, no filmmaker that I know of. He was completely unique. He was a stylist and uh, definitely uh, a total individual. Take any fire, any earthquake any major disaster, then wonder. Flying saucers, Captain, are still a rumor, officially. Looks like we beat them off again, sir. What do they want? Where are they from? Where are they going? Initially, the Edward revival was due to him being voted the worst director of all time. But whether you love them or hate them, you can't deny his films are certainly strange and unique, as was the life of Edward Jr. And this is Edward Jr. himself, as he's best remembered from his very first film. My mind's in a muddle, like in a thick fog. I can't make sense to myself sometimes. Ed's first film was released in 1953 and is best known as Glen or Glenda. But it was actually released under several different titles. Uh, Glen or Glenda, which is it? He or she? I changed my sex? I led two lives? And even the transvestite, which should give you a pretty good idea as to the subject matter. Why is the modern world shocked by this headline? Why? Once? Not so very long ago, the people of the world were saying... Airplanes. <laughs> Why? Nature makes mistakes. It's proven every day. This person is a transvestite, a man who is more comfortable wearing girls' clothes. The term transvestite is the name given by medical science to those persons who wear the clothing of the opposite sex. I thought I could stop wearing these things. I tried. Honestly, I tried. I haven't had a stitch of them on for nearly two weeks until tonight. Then I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to put them on or go out of my mind. Give this man satin undies, a dress, a sweater and a skirt, or even the lounging outfit he has on, and he's the happiest individual in the world. It cost just $29,000 and was financed by George Weiss, a producer of sexploitation pictures. Ed was the writer, director and star, but far from being just another crass exploitation film, it's actually an intensely personal statement. Glenn is engaged to be married to Barbara, a lovely, intelligent girl. The problem? Glenda, Glenn's other self. The girl that he himself is, his other individual personality. Actually, in Glen or Glenda, I wasn't allowed on the set. I didn't know the whole story of, of uh, him dressing in women's clothes. I didn't find that out till later. Because Edward wanted to marry me, and so he didn't let me know, you know, that he was dressing in drag. Then there was the time Barbara was wearing the sweater Glenn had always wanted to feel on his own body. It was becoming an obsession to him. He must have... What's the matter, Glenn, darling? <laughs> I guess I was daydreaming. Something seems to be troubling you. Why don't you tell me? He'd want to borrow my Angora sweater. And I asked why, because it wasn't the usual thing for a man to be asking a woman. Uh, he uh, 
said that it made him feel more comfortable, that it made his creative juices flow. <laughs> so I went along with it. Glenn has decided to tell Barbara of his dual personality. Tell her of the nighties and negligees, the sweaters and skirts, the robes and dresses, the stockings and the high-heeled shoes. Then, when it is all over and that much of the story he knows is told, Barbara is not sure of her own thoughts. Sometimes you take a person, what they are inside, and the good that they do for others and everything, and not just, uh, sometimes they can't help what they feel. I questioned it, but I went along with it. But in real life, Ed was not so honest with his fiancée. After the collapse of his relationship with Dolores Fuller, he courted and married Norma McCarthy. Now, of course, before, before he was married to you, he'd made Glen or Glenda. Had you seen that movie before you met No, him? I hadn't. Isn't that funny? I, well, I guess I just didn't uh, go see movies like that, or not that it was anything wrong with it, but I just, if I went to see a movie in those days, it was some big movie, you know, that had a lot of advertising. Had, had he spoken to you about making Daniel Glenda at all? No. I didn't know that he, you know, was a transfer site. I didn't know that until about six, seven weeks or so after we were married. Are you forgetting about my other self? You'll have to tell her, of course. Yeah. I have to tell her. But when? Before? Or after? I didn't understand. So I moved. I just, uh, I understand those things now, but I had two boys, and I just didn't... Uh, it, I'm from a strict family, and I saw I can't understand this. And as I told you earlier, all my friends said, of all people, for it to happen to Dixie, it had to be you, you know, they, you don't understand those things. But I, um, I understand that. Glenn or Glenda also features a bizarre appearance by the aging Hollywood horror star Bela Lugosi, whom Ed had befriended. Well, Wood was always a Bela Lugosi fan. And uh, he, of course, watched his films in the 30s and the 40s and grew up on them. And so uh, when he had the chance to work with Bela Lugosi, he jumped at it. And actually, uh, Wood was the only one who really used Lugosi in his last years. Sorry. As well as Baylor, another regular feature of Ed's films was his extensive use of stock footage. Wood always relied on stock footage. Apparently, he uh, could get it somewhat inexpensively. And, uh, I mean, when you look at uh, Glenn or Glenda, suddenly Bella Lugosi is yelling, pull the string, pull the string, and there are a bunch of buffalo stampeding down his face. Ed loved horror pictures. That was his favorite type of film. And uh, the fact that they were so close to each other, they just loved one another as, a, as friends. And they a little wanted to help Eddie. And it was his last years of his life, and I think he wanted very much to help him. It's sad to say, in the whole entire world, as great an actor as Bela Lugosi was, there was no one else uh, utilizing Lugosi. I mean, where were all these people when uh, Lugosi needed them? I don't know, but Ed Wood was there, and uh, Ed Wood was the only one. Wood's next film was The Bride of the Monster, and of all his work, it's probably the closest to a mainstream commercial picture. He started it in 1953, but it wasn't finished until 1955, because as usual, Ed had great problems in raising the cash. Ed finally raised the money from an Arizona farmer who took a small part in the film in return. Bela Lugosi was teamed up with another of Wood's favourites, a 400-pound Swedish wrestler called Tor Johnson. Ah! 
Bride of the Monster was to be Bela Lugosi's last ever speaking role. He plays Dr. Eric Vernoff, a crazed scientist who wants to create a race of atom-charged supermen after being spurned by his colleagues. I will perfect my own race of people. A race of atomic supermen which will conquer the world. <laughs> the film also marks the debut of one of Wood's regular characters, Kelton the Cop, played by Paul Marco. Oh. I wonder what that fool Kelton is doing now. Paul Marco named Kelton the Cop after this West Hollywood street where he still lives today. Kelton is always very energetic. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, can I help you, sir? And all full of energy and wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, you know? And um, can't do enough for you. Come in. Here's the late additions, Captain. Look, why can't I work on this case? Back to your desk. Yes, sir. And Kelton. Hey, yes, sir. I told the boy to bring the papers in himself. Yes, sir. But if you ask me... I didn't. I'm always going into the office and... I said, can, can I go out on a caper, sir? Can I? And he says, no, go back outside. And I said, yes, sir. And I always get sad. And I said, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, sir. And Kelton. Yes, sir. Where's Lieutenant Craig? In his office, I think. Send him in. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. That's about Kelton's whole dialogue is yes, sir, no, sir, yes, sir, in several scenes. And uh, I finally do go out and look for Lugosi. The mad doctor. Now, Professor Stravowski, you will get a much closer view of the product of my genius. By now, Lugosi's career was in decline, and he had become heavily addicted to hard drugs. In his later years, I understand he was taking formaldehyde. And uh, the night that when Ed wasn't going to let me drive him home, until Vela said, I got to have Paul drive him home. And uh, that's the night which I watched and witnessed him uh, take an injection. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. It just brought tears to my eyes. And his eyes were just as shiny like stars when he came on and says, now I feel better. Let's go. And I just felt like crying. And we went, and that's night, which was a long, cold night. And that's the night that he had to fight the octopus and get into that little water pool. <laughs> and uh, he did great, because I think he felt a lot better since he had the shot. I don't think Bale ever recovered from that, from the drugs he was taking. He was pretty de debilitated. And he tried to help him along as best he could. I mean, he looked after him because Vela got awfully sick. And, and he, he couldn't even go on during the day, during the making of the movie sometimes. But uh, he, he tried his best, and Eddie tried, and what more could they do? Oh. I have no home. Abandoned. Despised. Living like an animal. The jungle is my home. Lugosi was always uh, very fond of the speech that he makes about home. I have no home. For 20 years, I've lived in this jungle hell. And uh, he was so fond of that particular speech that he would be walking with Ed Wood on Hollywood Boulevard and then all of a sudden go into it and start reciting it. I was classed as a madman, a charlatan, outlawed in a world of science which previously honored me as a genius. Now here in this forsaken jungle hell, I have proven that I am all right.
Wood's next vehicle for Bela Lugosi was to be a horror film. He scraped together just enough cash to start filming The Vampire's Tomb at Lugosi's house when Lugosi suddenly passed away. What plan will you follow now? Plan 9. It's been absolutely impossible to work through these Earth creatures. Their soul is too controlled. Plan 9. Ah, oh, yes. Plan 9 deals with the resurrection of the dead. Even Ed couldn't resurrect Lugosi, but he could certainly work around him. Most filmmakers would decide that such a tremendous blow as your star dropping dead on the set would halt the project. You couldn't do it anymore. But he decided he wanted to finish up his masterpiece, so he rewrote the script and made a, a movie called Grave Robbers from Outer Space that became Plan 9 from Outer Space. The problem is his star is only in two minutes of film. Ed's inspired method of killing off Lugosi in the film was an out-of-shot car crash. The old man left that home, never to return again. He came up on the ingenious idea of hiring his wife's chiropractor named Dr. Tom Mason, who's a good foot taller than Bela Lugosi, looks nothing like him. And he got this uh, chiropractor to walk around in a Dracula cape, and he's got the cloak strewn across his face, so you really can't see what he looks like at all. Baylor's death wasn't Ed's only problem. As usual, he had run out of cash, but help was close at hand. Downstairs, there, there was this landlord and who was a Baptist, and uh, his name was Reynolds. And he and Eddie became friendly, and uh, all of a sudden, Eddie had the Baptist Church of Beverly Hills behind him. I do know that uh, Ed Wood, along with his entourage of friends, uh, when they discovered that Reynolds was a religious fellow, that they began to play along those lines and show a great interest in religion and the church. And they began to come around to the worship services on the Sunday morning. A deal was struck. Reynolds became the executive producer. But he is gone now. He also took a small part as a grave digger. He's the one on the right. Ed had found his money, but on one strange condition. One thing that uh, Reynolds demanded was that Eddie be baptized. And uh, he, in fact, he wanted me to go up there too. So anyway, and Tor, Tor Johnson. So Eddie says, OK, what the hell? I'll I'll go along with it. But it wasn't that simple, particularly when it came to baptizing the massive tour. He weighed about 400 pounds. The baptistry in the church couldn't accommodate his hulk. So the minister was a very uh, enterprising man, so he talked to one of the ladies in the church who had a swimming pool to allow Tor to be baptized in her swimming pool, <laughs> along with several other others of uh, Ed Wood's uh, devotees and it was quite a sight seeing all these people being baptized in that swimming pool and their hair was stringing and their face was wet and the mascara was running and as they it was it was it was quite a sight what they do to get money in hollywood i don't know this was a nth degree i think <laughs> but uh, that's how they got their money <laughs> People turning south from the freeway were startled when they saw three flying saucers high over Hollywood Boulevard. The plot, such as it is, concerns a bunch of extraterrestrials who, concerned by Earth's burgeoning nuclear capabilities, decide to execute the famous Plan 9, resurrecting the human dead and having them march on the world's capitals. In actual fact, in the movie, this grand scheme comes to very little because the only humans actually resurrected are the old man, played initially by Bela Lugosi, the uh, police detective, played by Tor Johnson, and the silent woman, who was played by a rather famous television horror hostess of the time, Vampira. You don't have any lines in the movie. Were you initially offered some? I was initially offered some lines. <laughs> I was initially offered some lines. But the fact is that the character, <clears throat> although I was billed as Vampira, the character wasn't Vampira as I had conceived her. 
And Par, as I had conceived her, was giddy, uh, out outrageous. And this was a different kind of a, because she was in a trance. And I just thought it would be better if she were in a trance. And I asked her, please do it mutely. And they said, well, OK. What was the set like for Plan 9? Well, I would say, as with everything that Ed did, ingenuity reigned. We had, uh, for example, turf made from God knows what under paper grass, you know, that was had uh, swellings and hollows, and one had to be careful not to trip on them, right? And uh, cardboard tombstones and dried off twigs that had been placed about thither and yon. But it was the general uh, impression of a, of a graveyard, but it was done with uh, what I call spit and gum wrappers. Last night I saw a flying object that couldn't have possibly been from this planet. But I can't say a word. I'm muzzled by army brass. I can't even admit I saw the thing. Gregory Walcott's friendship with the film's financier, Ed Reynolds, got him a plum part in the film, that of the plane's pilot. Normally, when I do a scene, I like to go onto the set ahead of time to get a feel of it, to feel the props and the space. And, and, uh, and uh, I said, Ed, where's the cockpit set? He said, well, they're building it. And uh, I kept looking, waiting for the cockpit to be delivered to the sound stage, a little dinky sound stage. And finally, a half hour before this cockpit scene was to be filmed, two carpenters brought on two pieces of masonite board and bent them into an arch and strung a shower curtain in the back and drug over a few pieces of the uh, uh, electronic uh, sets from the spaceship, and that that was the uh, the uh, cockpit. American Flight 812, this is Burbank Tower. If I were asleep, you'd never get on the ground. In your case, maybe I ought to leave you up there for good. Over. You got me that time, Mac. This is American Flight 812, request. <laughs> Burbank Tower to American Flight 812. My agent was furious when he discovered that I had done this, this, this planned grave robbers from out of space film. He was furious with me. He said, you've taken a giant step backwards in your career. Stop him, Turner. He's close enough. Turn off your electro gun. No! Now, this was supposed to be a horror film. And in those moments where people or the audience, audience was supposed to gasp in horror, the kids would laugh and giggle, you know. And I knew right away the film was in terrible trouble because it was just so bad. Just so bad. Colonel Tom Edwards, in charge of saucer field activities, was to make the greatest decision of his career. He made that decision. Colonel Edwards gave the signal to fire. One of the film's most noted features is, of course, the not-so-special effects. There are a couple of scenes where it looks like there are actually two pie tins that are stapled together, and they went around with a string and just took this pie, these pie tins stapled together and tried to make a flying saucer out of it. And I talked to one of the guys who did the props. He said, no, we didn't have the budget for pie tins. We used paper plates. They took a paper plate, they doused it in kerosene, they took a little cigarette lighter and just somehow let it burn on fire, making it look like a burning flying saucer. And I think that's the magic of Wood's films. One of the features that Ed Wood fans look forward to in his movies is the appearance of his repertory company, a bunch of like-minded stalwarts he'd gathered around himself. It's an odd collection of old stars like Bela Lugosi, minor television personalities like Vampiro and Criswell, Odd balls like Swedish wrestler Tor Johnson, and even a few personalities that Wood discovered himself. This is the astrologer Criswell, who opens Plan 9 with a mystic monologue. Greetings, my friends. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. And remember, my friends, future events such as these will affect you in the future. He was colorful. I liked him. I liked Chriswell. 
I like the whole assortment of, of people that Ed Wood had gathered around him. How do you think Ed did attract such a colourful group of people? They he seemed to draw them from somewhere, didn't they? Because he was an oddball. Birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> uh, they were kind of Ed's uh, menagerie, I call them. They consisted of ex-wives and astrologers and chiropractors and just kind of what would be considered fringe people. This is the story of those in the twilight time. Once human, now monsters, in a world between the living and the dead. Monsters to be pitied, monsters to be despised. Another of Ed's discoveries, Valda Hansen, was to star in his next film, Revenge of the Dead. He said, I'm looking for a girl with eyes like you and someone who can mesmerize and be the white ghost. So he had me read for him and he had me do a little skit of, um, oh, the Banshee, the Banshee. And he said, that's sensational, Valda. You are a good actress. Since Mrs. Wingate Yates Foster, through my benevolent society, wishes the arising of her dear departed husband, Wingate, we tonight will bring him from that which was thought to be his final resting place. In it, we are duping the people in these seances. And consequently, as time goes on, we draw the real, the real dead. And so that is why it is the night of the ghouls. And it ends up, they come after us. I've had friends, and I watch it on our VCRs, and they say, Valda, how do you make your fingers wiggle like that? They said, you should put that just that scene on a commercial, just those fingers. How do you make them wiggle? They look like they're doing the coochie-coochie. <laughs> <laughs> Ed's next film was The Bride and the Beast. He wasn't in the director's chair this time, but his screenplay was so distinctive that it's unmistakably an Edward Jr. film. It tells the story of a beautiful young girl who marries an animal trainer, but discovers on their wedding night that she's much more attracted to the gorilla he keeps locked in the basement. Still with me? Okay, well, rather upset about this strange desire, she quite naturally visits a psychiatrist who discovers, after some lengthy scenes of jungle stock footage, that she was once a gorilla herself in a past life. This explains not only her unhealthy obsession, but also her deep-rooted love of Angora sweaters. Go into a deeper sleep now. Deep, deep, deep. Cool wind brushes my... My fur. What kind of fur is the wind brushing? There. There is the water. I don't... I don't want to go to the water. I'm so frightened of the water. I see my reflection. I'm... I'm a gorilla. He loved my Angora sweater, my blue one. You know, he called it Mr. Angora. He had a fetish for Angora. And, uh, and then he had an Angora dress, a pink one. That he was gorgeous in with his green eyes, you know, and a wig. But he, he didn't try to hide it. By the early 1960s, Ed's career as a low-budget auteur was really over. His dream of joining the cinematic greats was never to be realized. 
Unable to raise money for his own projects, he tried to earn his keep as a screenwriter. But sadly, for the rest of his life, he really earned his living as the author of trashy novels aimed mainly at the sex market. One of Ed's books was filmed in 1966 as Orgy of the Dead. He wrote novels with uh, usually transvestite themes like Killer and Drag, Death of a Transvestite, Diary of a Transvestite Hooker, or books with a carnival theme. Who published the books? Small uh, porno houses. Did Corinth you? Books, uh, Eros Publishing, Pad Library. These were not books you would find in the local library. You said earlier that it was very cut folk business. Was it possible for Ed to make much money from the films? Oh, Nard, no. Poor Eddie. He was not a good money manager, businessman. He, in fact, some of the business managers were, uh, took him for a lot. He, uh, to my knowledge, and I was with him for practically most of the movies, he ended up with epis nothing. Maybe maybe the the wage that he made during the movie for the director for the uh, the script, but he, we never really made any anything out of it. There was always this smart money guy around that that siphoned off most of it or or manipulated it somehow, and um, that's why that's why poor Eddie died so broke. Ed, however, never lost faith in his films, particularly Plan 9, and a whole new generation was about to rediscover it. Uh, Plan 9 played every station on local television. It started from CBS down to local TV, and 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a call. Ed, we're on! Get Turn Channel 9 on, Channel 13 on! Because he stayed up all night long writing scripts, and Minute Plan 9 was on, he called up everybody. And I was on the top of the list to watch Plan 9. He was very happy with Plan 9. He loved it. And he rented it all the time, and had Plan 9 parties. And he used his brains and imagination, and I don't think it was a silly picture at all. I don't think a lot of the kids do either, you know. Oh, I'm over life, and I swear in my battle that the others will ride us on. Just recently, Plan 9 has been turned into a musical, ensuring that the legend of Ed Wood Jr. lives on. Well, Ed Wood has turned into a whole cottage industry. It's amazing how many different facets of Wood's life have been mined. I mean, first of all, back in 1981, there was an Ed Wood film marathon at UCLA. And uh, here you can see there's a, a hairy leg and a high heel, a giant rubber octopus, a flying saucer, and a gravestone that's about to tip over because it's made out of cardboard. There is the Paul Marco I Love Kelton the Cop fan club. As far as I know, there's only one member, and that's Paul Marco himself. And I started some merchandise. I Kelton the Cop t-shirts, I love Kelton the Cop bumper stickers, I love Kelton the Cop med medallions, and also keychains that says, good luck forever, on the back, Paul Marco. Uh, Kelton the Cop balloons. They're just general t-shirts uh, for Plan 9 from Outer Space. I've seen this t-shirt even without Plan 9 from Outer Space on it. All you have to do is show a picture of Tor Johnson and Von Pyra, and people know what movie you're talking about. Oh, baby, baby, I know a stranger than Big John. I know that I was in, in front of the camera for f about 15 minutes. And that's all, your, your entire on-screen appearance was shot in? Of 50, 15 silent minutes, which has given me an entire new career. Thank you, Mr. Wood. <laughs> 
You listening? <laughs> I'm attracted to love just like a butcher like the top of his face. But to me, love is a death to find me. What do you think he would make of the attention that's focused on his work now? Oh, God. He'd be thrilled that he's got so much attention. I'm not arbitrarily sure he'd like the nature of it. <laughs> he would think it's come a little late, but uh, I think he'd be very pleased that that some sort of a claim is being given to him. He's probably looking down with a big smile. Maybe with his teeth in, maybe without it. But he's smiling, saying, gosh, I'm glad they like my movies because I like making them. Whatever you may think about the films of Edward Jr., he had one great talent that no one can deny. He could take his ideas and, against almost impossible odds, put them on screen. While many of the more acceptable and mainstream directors of the period are now all but forgotten, the films of Edward Jr. are still being talked about and enjoyed all over the world. So, he must have done something right. I'm getting a plan. This gives me a plan. Two more incredibly strange filmmakers are profiled next week. Hong Kong's